welcome and I look forward very much to our conversation today. Thank you so much. I thought that we might start our conversation with some of the ideas that emerged from your book and particularly the way that you explore the idea of restructuring the legal response to domestic violence. And you speak of creating a women-centred system built on anti-essentialist feminist principles. Well, I thought it might be helpful for you just to explain exactly what this anti-essentialist feminist model actually is. To some extent, that's academic language for saying that there is no one-size-fits-all solution to domestic violence and no one typical victim of domestic violence. And so what an anti-essentialist feminist system would do would be to be centered around individual women, around their needs, around their goals, and around the things that they seek from a justice system. It wouldn't have one-size-fits-all solutions. The solutions would be individualized. Um, it would be a system that took into account the different identities that women bring with them and the ways in which those identities intersect and the ways in which those identities affect their experiences of violence. So rather than talking about women writ large, we're talking about women of color, we're talking about low-income women, we're talking about immigrant women, uh, we're talking about rural women, we're talking about women with disabilities, all of the different kinds of identities that affect someone's experience of violence. And the system would not have mandatory principles because it would recognize that women's autonomy and agency are paramount and mandatory principles, mandatory uh, policies tend to override the individual wishes of particular women in terms of how they want to respond to the violence in their lives. So the, the individualization and is, is clearly away from anything that smacks of stereotyping. And, and I, I noticed that um, in your book also you speak about for problems and obstacles and that stereotyping I think plays into those. I wondered whether you might expand upon what those four problems are. Sure. So in my book, I identify really four limitations of the mm. law's response to domestic violence. Um, the first has to do with the ways in which the law defines domestic violence. The legal system tends to define domestic violence very narrowly um, around physical abuse rather than the other forms of abuse that people suffer. It doesn't really take into account, it varies, but it doesn't generally take into account emotional or psychological abuse, economic abuse, spiritual abuse, reproductive abuse, um, the kinds of things that can be incredibly debilitating to an individual that really go to the heart of who an individual is, but aren't physical abuse. And so it's a way of essentializing the violence, I guess you could put it. The second has to do with the stereotyping of women, that the law is organized around a particular kind of perfect victim, one who is weak and meek and passive and needs very much for the legal system to come in as her hero or her champion to save her from the violence that is occurring in the home. Uh, that stereotyping does a, a real disadvantage to women who don't meet it. And when you come into court in some other posture as a woman who is angry, as a woman who has fought back, uh, for example, if you may find it difficult to get assistance from the legal system. The third issue that I identify is the ways in which the legal system is focused on separation and the idea that all women either can separate or should want to separate from their abusers and that we've created law and policy that's really based on this idea of separation without ensuring, one, that separation actually keeps people safe, and the research would suggest that it doesn't, and two, without asking women if separation from their partners is really what they want. So many of my clients don't want to be separated from their partners. They simply want the abuse to stop. But in the legal system, we haven't really developed remedies that do that particularly well. The fourth issue that I identify is with mandatory policies. Um, in the United States, we have mandatory arrest, where police are required to make an arrest whenever they have probable cause to do so, but only in cases of domestic violence. And we have something called no-drop prosecution, where prosecutors will bring forward a case regardless of what the victim's wishes are, and in the strongest iterations of those policies, will arrest and detain women in order to have them in, uh, engaged in prosecution. And so all of those problems really go to this anti-essentialist ideal, right? The idea that we've created a system that's premised on stereotypes, on ideas about who knows best, what's best for women who've been subjected to abuse, um, that substitutes the judgment of the state in some cases for the judges, judgments of individual women about what their justice goals should be. Well, there's so many ideas that are wrapped up in that. Um, maybe I will just pull out some of those threads and we can weave them into our conversation. One of them is, um, I think, the, the difficulty in both the, the fact that there are civil justice responses, 
and criminal justice responses. And, and when you spoke about the, the autonomy of the, the woman and taking control and being able to have her views known, um, speaking in this context in a gendered way, although we both recognise that violence in, in families, domestic violence, is not only about violence to women, right. but we know statistically that women predominantly uh, are the ones who suffer most. If we try and um, unpick the idea of autonomy and, and the complexity of the fact that there are responses that are essentially civil responses, where a person is the one who sues another mm -hmm. for damage of one kind or another, and then the criminal justice responses which involve the police, it gets difficult then, I think, to find out how we, how we find a place for autonomy, particularly in a criminal justice context. Yeah, I do think that is the hardest place um, to find that that space for autonomy. But I do think it's particularly important, especially when we're talking about intimate relationships, because essentially what the criminal justice system has the power to do is to end people's intimate relationships. And that's a very different kind of response to crime than, say, a stranger assault or a traffic accident. Um, and so in thinking through who has power within that system, my guiding principle is that in any case in which a woman can be given more power in the state less, I'd like to see the woman have more power in the state less. And I do think it's interesting, in the realm of domestic violence, we have made policy decisions that are different than in any other place in criminal justice. So for example, there is no other crime for which there is mandatory arrest. Only in the context of domestic violence have we made that determination. And we've made it, if you look at kind of the literature leading up to the inception of mandatory arrest, in part out of concern about police unwillingness to treat domestic violence as a crime, but in part out of concern about women's inability or unwillingness to make those reports themselves. And so it's the only place where the state really substitutes its judgment for the judgment of the individual involved in a crime. In almost every other crime, police have discretion to determine whether a charge should be laid. And oftentimes part of exercising that discretion is in having a conversation with the person who's been subjected to the crime about whether that charge is something they'd like to see brought forward. So it sounds like it's, it's almost another incidence of excessive paternalism. I call it maternalism because I think it comes from a good place. I think it comes from a place of caring and concern about individual people who've been subjected to abuse. But in the end, the result is exactly the same. It's substituting one's judgment for someone else's out of a belief that you know what's best for them. You also spoke of this mandatory separation approach. Um, it's interesting, some years ago there was a big royal commission here on human relationships which took some years and was chaired by Elizabeth Evatt who was in fact a predecessor in my role in heading the Australian Law Reform Commission. And one of the things that struck me in that work was how many women and went back to relationships that were essentially abusive relationships. And it, it, it has echoes with what you're saying about this, you know, this, this approach to enforce separation is not necessarily the right goal. And these women kept going back because they loved the person. They wanted the abuse to stop. They didn't want the relationship to end. And so the idea of separation might, ru might run at odds with that idea. Does that resonate with some of the things that you've found as well? It absolutely does. Um, the vast majority of my clients don't necessarily want their relationships to end. They want the abuse to stop. If they are unsuccessful in getting the abuse to stop, then they necessarily terminate those relationships, but not because it was what they wanted. Mm. And in fact, as a very young lawyer, I had a client educate me about this because I thought that ending these relationships would be what anyone would want. And she was very clear to say, I did not enter this marriage wanting it to end. And this is someone with whom I have children and I have an emotional investment in this relationship. Many of my clients love their partners and we have a hard time, I think, within the battered women's movement, having that conversation about people who still love people who abuse them. Um, but that is the reality. And in fact, in the States, there's at least one study that suggests that in one integrated domestic violence court, 70% of the couples going through that criminal court either were still together or planned to stay together. So that we have so many people coming through the system who are not interested mm. in separating, but that we offer them nothing, either in terms of addressing the violence in their relationships or helping them to try to reorder their relationships in any way, seems to me a huge omission. Yeah, so the central idea is, is in fact respecting the relationship and finding where things are going wrong in that relationship and using 
both the civil and the criminal justice systems, perhaps in aid of that relationship? I think respecting what the person subjected to abuse wants to see happen in that relationship. Um, and that if what they want is for that relationship to continue, then respecting that choice and allowing that choice to be made and providing options that help to support that choice, absolutely. One of the other things you mentioned was about your clinic work and representing clients. I found that an, in, an interesting um, aspect of your career because very much uh, the model in Australia is, is to have a greater separation between the, the academic life and role and advocacy in court. Because one thing that the research here, both through the work that the Australian Law Reform Commission did, but also in the work that I came to know um, and respect greatly through that work in, in our work on family violence, was the support work of, of violence services, um, both um, in, in immediate practical support, whether through refuge, refuges or advice, but also support in court where that was needed and um, through representation, through advocacy, and how valued that was by the, the particularly the women, because these were essentially women's services, how valued that, that was to them. So perhaps if I can ask you to tell us about the, import, the nature of and the importance of your representational work in your career and life. Of course. So before I entered academia, I had been a legal services lawyer and I had provided representation to women, primarily women and also children in custody and divorce and protective order cases um, for about three to four years. And I loved that work. I, I couldn't imagine not doing that work. When I went into academia, I went in as what we call a clinical legal professor. So in the United States, we've developed a model of clinical education that's based on the idea that just as you wouldn't want a doctor operating on you who had never seen a human body, you shouldn't have a lawyer representing you who'd never heard a case before. And so what I do is to supervise students who are representing clients in live client cases. And my students represent clients in domestic violence protective order and divorce and custody cases. Um, and I did that for about 11 years before I moved on to another place and had the opportunity to think a little bit more broadly about the kind of work that I wanted to do. I had primarily done family law work, but I wanted to do something that looked at violence across the different silos that we usually put it in. So domestic violence people don't always talk to rape and sexual assault people, who don't always talk to trafficking people, who don't always talk to other kinds of, of workers. And I wanted to think about all of those things and think about how they interrelated and talk with my students about how they interrelated. So my students currently represent clients in cases involving intimate partner violence, rape and sexual assault, trafficking, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender discrimination and violence, and in hyper-incarceration of women, uh, particularly women who've been subjected to gender violence. We do everything that you can imagine um, in terms of civil litigation. We do some post-conviction parole work on behalf of women prisoners. We do policy work uh, in a variety of different areas, and we do community education work. And I really believe that it is the best model for students to learn how to become lawyers, particularly under our system where there's no distinction between a solicitor and a barrister. But I also think it's integral to my research um, in that so much of what I write about is colored by my experiences in court with individual clients and the things that I see happen in the legal system on a day in and day out basis. I can't imagine being effective as a scholar without having access to the court system and to my clients and to their experiences on a day to day basis. I think it's at the heart of what I do and I don't think I could do without it. Well, I must say your, um, your passion for, for what you do and the experience obviously shows in, in, in your work. One of the things you mentioned was about silos and um, it's definitely, uh, it, it definitely resonates with us here in Australia and the experience, particularly in a federal system where matters concerning divorce and family law generally are uh, conducted under federal law and federal courts where all of the other matters that domestic violence involves, whether it's child protection issues, criminal law matters, the civil law, family violence, protective order re uh, regime, um, the, the silos uh, and the different attitudes and cultures that pervade those, those different areas was certainly something that came out in the, the, the report, the inquiry we did. And also it's quite clear in the published research about falling between the gap 
Um, there was a wonderfully titled article from excellent researchers in the Australian Institute of Family Studies called Mind the Gap. But drawing the responses together um, through your work and in the, the work that research and, and law reform policy bodies like the ALRC does here, I think lays important foundations. But perhaps uh, taking, taking you to another particular area, um, the, the idea of restorative justice is something that you've explored a lot. And it was certainly something w that we touched on in our work, but we found um, at the time we wrote, and our report was written now five years ago, mm -hmm. that um, at the time we didn't feel confident that there was enough data to support us as a law reform body making specific recommendations, um, particularly in the area of sexual assault where the, the reviews, if I can say this, are quite mixed. Mm -hmm. Um, but um, important work going on, but both in the Victorian Law Reform Commission and, and in our own work, but we didn't feel confident to make specific recommendations at that time until there was further data, but was certainly worth revisiting. So I wondered perhaps you might like to talk about your thoughts and experience and ideas in the restorative justice context. So one of the, the alternatives to the legal response that I offer in my book is restorative justice. I think it's very complicated and I'm not sure the data is any better now than it was five years ago. Part of the reason for that is because people are terrified of using restorative justice in intimate partner violence and sexual assault cases and I understand that. It comes from a very deep concern about power imbalances, about safety, about holding people accountable, and about ceding back to communities some of what the state has taken over in terms of the policing of domestic violence. But the bottom line for me is that there are many of my clients uh, who are not particularly well served by the legal system, and particularly for people who don't want to use state-based systems at all, who may be concerned about exposing their partners to state violence in response to their intimate violence, um, who are co-parenting either by choice or because the state has ordered them to do so, or who are living in small geographic or ethnic or religious communities, there's a real need for someone to help them reorder those relationships um, to whatever state they're going to be in, whether they choose to remain in relationship or not. And restorative justice is a tool for helping us to do that. So do I think that restorative justice is a great diversion uh, tactic in, uh, as an alternative to the criminal justice system? I'm not sure. And restorative justice requires that people accept accountability for their actions before that process even begins. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that many of the people who are using abuse um, are ready to accept responsibility at that point of diversion right, from the criminal justice system. And I wouldn't want to see us walk away from that requirement. I think it's part of what makes restorative justice so useful is that someone has accepted responsibility. But in terms of then helping people who aren't using the criminal justice system or who might want to come back to restorative processes later because their justice goals were not met by using either the criminal or the civil justice systems, I think it can be really powerful. And some of the qualitative data that's out there suggests that women subjected to abuse have found it incredibly powerful to be able to confront their abusers and to have those conversations that the legal system doesn't allow you to have. You know, one of the things that victims of domestic violence want very much is voice, the ability to tell their stories the way that they want to tell them and to receive in return validation of those stories and vindication, the sense that some wrong was done to you. And that's a very difficult thing to achieve in the legal system given the rules of evidence and the constraints on testimony. So the kind of restorative justice that I envision gives people the opportunity to have the space to tell their stories the way that they want them told, to have the community come in in a supportive way and provide them with whatever reparation, whether that be emotional or material that they might need, and to have the abuser held accountable before that community, which can then help to monitor subsequent behavior to ensure that the violence doesn't recur. The idea of validation that you mentioned is, is a most intriguing one because it's in, in the context of relationships and in um, the context of dissolving relationships, we've taken the accountability out of the mm -hmm. equation in many ways since the mid-1970s. So that um, since the mid-1970s in Australia and certainly in, in the UK and other jurisdictions, the move has been to have divorce mm -hmm. on a no-fault basis. Accountability or saying someone is responsible has really gone. And it's interesting to see this, this sense in, in the domestic violence context for this, this need for accountability, the need 
for a, a woman's voice or whoever is the person suffering to have their sense of wounding validated. So there's, a, there's some interesting contrasts, theoretically, I think, in, in what's going on here. And in the kind of in the realm of the practical, I see this every day. In, in the state of Maryland, we still have fault-based grounds for divorce, and two of them are cruelty and excessively vicious conduct. And I have cases in which my clients could make out cases just for a, a separation, and that could be the grounds for their divorce. But they feel very strongly about going forward on the cruelty and excessively vicious conduct grounds because they want someone to say, what happened to you was wrong, this relationship ended through no fault of yours, and that matters to them. I also have clients who could settle their protective order matters, they could have a consent order, and refuse to enter into consent orders because they want the opportunity to go before a judge and tell their story. That makes me very nervous mm -hmm. because I say to them, I can't guarantee you that we're going to get this order if we go this direction, but I can guarantee you that you'll walk out of here with an order if we can do a consent. And they say, the order is not my goal. My goal is to tell this story and have this person who I was partnered with know that I'm telling people publicly what happened, that I'm powerful enough to do that, that they can't hurt me now. And I think that's such a powerful lesson, not just for me, but for my students to learn, that whatever the legal outcome is that we think we're going to accomplish, that we seem to think is the most important thing, is often not the most important thing to the person who's been abused. And I guess that's where listening to what the person wants as the solution for them is really the key goal in policy terms. For me, that's everything. For me, any conversation about what we should do in response to intimate partner violence has to start with what are the person's mm -hmm. goals. And those goals are going to be so different depending on who you're talking to. For some people, it's economic security. For some people, it's continuing in the relationship. For some people, it's retributive punishment, which mm -hmm. is why we can't let go of the criminal justice system altogether. Because I would hate to see that not be an option for someone for whom that's their goal. But we need to be attentive to these things and we need to not try to work through one size fits all systems that assume they know what people's goals are. It's interesting when you mention that you still have fault-based divorce. And when one looks at the, um, the grounds for an expanded understanding of domestic violence, one thing that struck me was that the, the interest in expanding the understanding and definition to include psychological issues as violence issues, the words that kept coming back in my mind were mental cruelty, mm -hmm. which used to be a ground for dissolution of marriage, for divorce. And so it's, it's, it's interesting to find that, that sense of wanting to have a label for things or a place to put that sense of, I've been subjected to this in, in a different context. So it's that sense of, um, as you said, sometimes it's just validation of being heard or on, on other occasions it, it is actually about a retributive response. Mm -hmm and that's where the criminal justice system becomes important. I think that's right. I think what's also interesting about kind of the expansion of the definition of domestic violence is what we want to do with that. So mm -hmm. as I said earlier, one of the criticisms I make of the legal system is that it's excessively focused on physical abuse to the exclusion of other kinds of abuse. But I don't think that necessarily means we want a crime of emotional abuse. Um, and in the UK, they've now gone to a crime of, of coercive and controlling behavior. I'm worried about that. I'm worried about the unintended consequences of that kind of law. In the United States, when we passed mandatory arrest laws, which I described earlier, we got lots more arrests, but many of them were of women. Um, the rates of arrests of women went up, the rates of dual arrests went up. And I worry that if you expand the definition of domestic violence so broadly to recognize all of the forms of violence that people experience, you might unintentionally capture a lot of behavior that is not exactly what we meant to capture and the rates of the rest of women, quite frankly, will go up again. Um, for me, the crux of that coercive and controlling behavior is that it fundamentally limits someone's liberty or autonomy within the relationship if, if we were to expand the definition of domestic violence to, co to cover those other kinds of things, I want that to be part of it. It's one thing to nag at somebody, and it's another thing to control somebody's behavior so that they're materially unable to carry out their everyday tasks, for example. I think you touch on a really uh, a raw point in a way, that there is, there is a need for a much greater understanding of the dynamics of family violence domestic violence in relationships and how controlling can be physical, but it can also be as much as the click of a pen, mm -hmm. you know, the clicking of the biro or um, a gentle touch or even with 
withholding of a touch can be violent in the context of the relationship. But what the law does with that is an entirely different matter. And that just because something is recognised as being within the realm of violence in a domestic situation doesn't necessarily mean that it is ne has to be criminalised. Right. I think that the people who are involved, whether it's in a civil justice system or a criminal justice system, need to understand the dynamics of the relationship but the law doesn't need to make everything criminal as a result. One of the things that um, I notice is of difference between the United States and Australia, while we are both federations with the complexities that that involves, that in the US you have a federal act, which is Violence Against Women Act, whereas in this country it would be very difficult to have a national act, a federal act. We can have nationally consistent approaches encouraged by reports such as the report of the ALRC, but um, we would not be able to achieve that kind of legislation. So I'd be interested in your observations about national approaches or national legislation as distinct from the complexities of all the state laws. Well, I think that's just it, that our national legislation is not so much about substantive law and practice so much as it is about funding. It's hard to overstate how important the Violence Against Women Act was in some ways in that it served as a federal recognition of the scope of the problem of violence against women and an acknowledgement of the problem and, and the commitment to put federal resources to deal with that problem. But we still have 50 states and various territories and other jurisdictions and various statuses, each of which has its own protective order law, each of which has its own family law. So in some ways, your federal family law puts you kind of ahead of us in terms of a standardization. And that carries with it all the same problems I think that you see here, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, although there is the full faith and credit clause in the United States uh, Constitution which says that you have to recognize one state's orders in another state, there are difficulties in enforcement, there are difficulties in recognition. Um, as a practical matter, it may be more challenging than it sounds to have Florida's act or Florida's order recognized in Oregon, for example. Um, we have different laws state to state on criminal uh, matters, and so unless a crime is committed across state lines, federal law doesn't intervene there either. So it's actually much more similar, but for this funding piece, I think that we've been able to enact. And that funding piece has been a wonderful thing in a lot of ways, but it's also been the thing that's driven the disproportionate focus on the criminal justice response in the United States. So for me, it's a bit of a mixed bag. Yes, I, I can see how that would work. Um, I think what we've tried to do is to suggest ways that you could get a nationally consistent approach, but also the importance of seeing issues in their distinct mm -hmm. contexts and recognising where there is very good work going on. And um, what I observed in the um, ALRC's inquiries was where you get the various players in the system working together, so police, child protection, the social services, um, the support services, the more you can get key people who might be first responders, the more you can get them working together, working with a common understanding, referring people to the support and help that they may need or may not need in particular cases, the better that the systems can be. Mm -hmm. And how to kept capture that as best practice to propel the improvement in an ongoing and enduring way one of the elements went to judicial officers in terms of a bench book, capturing best practice. Do you have similar um, examples like that in, in these states? We have NGOs that do an enormous amount of best practices work, and there are more documents than I can count that lay out those best practices. So we definitely have that work going on. In terms of bench books, again, because we're so state specific, those resources tend to be state to state and even jurisdiction to jurisdiction. One thing I would like to open up is some criticism. Um, the, there has been criticism in the US of some of your work, particularly that perhaps advocating for restorative justice and a restructured legal response might lead law enforcement agencies to treat domestic violence differently from other crimes. Mm -hmm. Perhaps now I can open you up on, on your response to such criticism. I want them to treat domestic violence differently than they treat other crimes, although it would be lovely if they would have the kinds of conversations with victims of all crimes 
as the kind of conversation I'd like them to have in the context of intimate partner violence. I think that the idea that I'm taking us back, and that's been the criticism, you're taking us back to the bad old days when police didn't intervene and prosecutors didn't prosecute. I don't think that's accurate and I don't think it would happen, but I have to say there is no good research suggesting that mandatory arrest is making women any safer or is lowering rates of domestic violence or that uh, mandatory prosecution is doing the same thing. And so to suggest that somehow that we've reached some idyllic level of practice and procedure that's working well for all people subjected to abuse I think is a bit ridiculous and really problematic in that it ignores the particular needs of populations that have no desire to engage with the state whatsoever. I think particularly as to restorative justice we have a bit of a chicken and egg problem in that everyone is so afraid to do anything with restorative justice in the context of intimate partner violence that we can't possibly know whether it will work or not. The couple of studies that are out there are very promising, I think. And I think if those of us who are interested in domestic violence, who have knowledge and expertise, would be willing to commit ourselves to doing that kind of practice, then we could come out with the kind of research that might help us to understand the problem better and better inform our policy efforts. But this idea that we somehow have a perfect system that's doing just fine by everyone, I think is a, a joke, frankly. It's laughable. And giving people more options, giving people more voice, giving people a greater say in what happens to them, I just fail to see how that's a bad thing. Mm. Well, complacency is certainly the enemy of any law reform as well. So I have some sympathy <laughs> with that approach. One other thing that um, I was interested in, and it's, it's, it, it's the issue of language. When the ALRC was doing the big project we did on family violence, which traversed so many of the laws, 26 different legal systems I added up, um, I was very uncomfortable, as, as were my fellows working on the inquiry, I was uncomfortable with the language of perpetrator and victim. Mm -hmm. That didn't sit well with me. Um, while I agree that it's really it, the, a key thing is accountability, I was uncomfortable with, with labels and the labels of perpetrator and victim are very much labels of the criminal law and where domestic violence issues traverse so many civil issues as well as criminal, I just felt very uncomfortable. So we, we struggled to find a different way. So we used, it's very clumsy, but by explaining the, the disquiet, the discomfort, it shows why we came up with this. We talked about those who used family violence or those who suffered or experienced. We even eschewed the word suffered, so it was those who used and those who experienced, to try and find the, the flattest terminology we could that um, recognised that we were dealing with violence, but rather not trying to label people in any particular way. So I wondered if you had uh, similar concerns about language issues here. I did, um, and the first footnote in my book is a lengthy disquisition on exactly that topic. I have not used the terms victim, or in the United States, a very popular term is survivor as well. And I've not used either of those terms in quite a long time, except, of course, when I slip in conversation. Um, Victim because it, both because they define a person by their experiences, and I think that's problematic. A person is much more than the experience of violence. And victim because some people are no longer feeling victimized and survivor because some people don't feel that they've reached the point of being a survivor. Um, I started with the term women subjected to abuse, and the reason I used the term uh, subjected was because I thought it was important to put responsibility for the violence where it lay, which is with the other person. So saying women who experience abuse, for example, is a passive kind of construction that doesn't provide uh, any sense of who might be responsible for the, the wrongdoing in this case. Mm -hmm. um, and I hate the term batterer. Uh, which is the common term in the United States, because again, it, it suggests that this person is only defined through the action of being abusive. So I tend to use the term people who abuse and people subjected to abuse so that we're clear about the phenomenon that we're talking about, but that we also recognize that these are people with lots of other dimensions besides the fact that they've been involved in intimate partner violence in some way. Well, I think that's explored so many topics of um uh, similar interest, similar concern, and also that are very much alive in our own national conversations, both in the United States and Australia. And I wondered if, if in, in concluding our conversation, if there were particular aspirational goals, um, things that you would like 
to be takeaway messages in, in your visit to Australia and your Fulbright sponsored tour? Absolutely. There is one thing for me that is larger than any other. I know that Australia is grappling with the problem of criminalization and, and particularly with a feeling that charges aren't necessarily being laid as often as they should be, that the criminal justice system is not working on the behalf of people subjected to abuse as actively as it should be. And absolutely, I think that's a problem. But I would caution not to turn the way that we did in trying to solve those problems to mandatory policies that really rob people subjected to abuse of any kind of autonomy or agency in helping to make decisions about what the status of their relationship should be. There are intermediate steps, I think, that can be taken where police and prosecutors in consultation with people subjected to abuse can make decisions about what best meets the justice goals of those people, what is safest for them, and not just physically safest, but economically safest and emotionally safest and safe in a variety of ways that we frequently don't talk about when we use those buzzwords of safety and accountability. So don't go to the mandatory policy route. That would be the one takeaway message I would leave you with. Well, thank you very much, Lee Goodmark, for your contributions to this conversation and to the ongoing work of ANROSE, which is a research body that came out of the National Council uh, to reduce violence against women and their children. It's a very important initiative and it reflects a commitment by the, the, the national government and state governments towards this very important goal. So I have enjoyed our conversation greatly and thank you, ANROSE, for giving us this opportunity to do this conversation today. Thank you.